Some people say we start dying the moment we are born. Are we always traveling two roads, the living road and the dying road? Now that we've really established the circle and we've cleansed and we're just going to share reminiscence, um, things, dreams, how our lives have been since the last time we came together and because this is a healing circle for us too, those of us that knew and loved Joan. Right after all her stuff was taken out of her apartment, I went in there and all the wallpaper was gone. You know, it was kind of a weird trip. And um, the house getting torn down, just like how the transients of everything. Mm -hmm. It was the death that I got to be so involved in that it was complete for me. And last July, I was at Joan's house till midnight almost every night. And what did we do? We sat around and talked about her entire life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We basically, she knew and we knew that she needed to do this to die and it was good for us and good for her and we looked at slides and she told stories and I, it was so wonderful that, you know, I remember feeling when she was dying that there wasn't anything, you know, that I wished I could have said or could have mm -hmm. done, that this was a case for me where I had enough time. I learned so much from Joan. I can't imagine a more natural or embracing way of making the transition than what I saw with Joan. She loved life so much, you know, but how can you know how you would feel if you were in that position? Yeah. But it was, you know, it just made me think that same thing. Well, God, if I would be spent, I mean, but the passion that she applied to just trying to stay alive, if you have the good fortune of being alive, you could apply to doing what you love to <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's good yeah, to hear all your stories because it's it certainly puts back on me the you know is this a good day to die you know if you mm -hmm. if you really do have one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel which I sort of feel life is like that you just don't mm -hmm. you know you like to think you're got a plan but mm -hmm. you know God knows I've been spun around in my car a few times and, mm -hmm. you know what you know where where am I and what am I doing and like like just coming into what matters yeah. in, in the, the gift of the, the short corporeal life. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just like the peacefulness of this picture and the openness and it looks like it was a cool day. So I feel good. I, f I feel like I can see myself breathing in that photograph. And I'm holding the rock up with my finger because I've gotten so strong and he's doing a handstand. I just wanted to show me my yoga, the strength of my body, and how I did take really good care of myself. This is when I'm graduating from chiropractic school. That's how I looked. That's how, who I was at that time in the world. And it's interesting having gone through these photographs because I have seen how my face has changed all along. This is not what I thought I would look like, you know. But it was like, oh, this is really not a different process. Joan was a friend of mine and a colleague. We had offices just down the street from each other. In 1990, Joan discovered a lump in her breast and she went to an oncologist. He found that it was uh, breast cancer. 
the lump was removed, but um, it turned out that pathology tests showed they hadn't removed all of the, hadn't gotten all the cancer. So I think she then had a second lumpectomy. That didn't do it either. At that point, one would generally have a mastectomy, but Joan didn't. The MD she was working with in New York um, persuaded her that the program that she was on would take care of that and she didn't need to have the mastectomy. And she believed him and went with that. And she decided to come to me in late 1991. I thought the lump was still there or a new one had grown. I asked her and begged her to get another opinion, but she said no, that she trusted the doctor she was seeing. She was on that program for two years. She was really faithful. She did it all right. And still she had this, this lump in her breast that grew and grew and grew. She finally went to see a surgeon and finally took the surgeon's advice to have a mastectomy. I think that was 1993. So her surgeon told me later that she cried when she opened Joan up because the cancer was everywhere. It was all in the chest wall. She had to like dig it out from between the, the ribs. A little while later, it went to her lungs. When I first saw Joan in my office, I had the feeling that she might not make it. And I decided to videotape her as a way of remembering her and as a gift to her friends. And it was only years later that I began to see the real reason why I was filming Joan during the last two years of her life was that I had never drawn close to someone who was trying to die consciously. And out of Joan's struggle arose vital questions about my own mortality and my own fears of dying. We know everything changes and dies. So why do we resist our own change and death? This, this really isn't that bad. <laughs> I'm on oxygen 24 hours a day. <laughs> it's not really that bad, you know. I'll be, you know, next week I'll probably only have it on half time or, or something. And, and that may be true. And of course, I hope it is, but there's some, I mean, I think that's the trickster again. You know, that's the like, oh, next week. Next week, it will be different. I'll be better. And here I am today. It's like there's no next week, you know. There have been moments when it's been really wonderful. It's like, oh. This place of peace, of like moving slow and not having to rush somewhere and not having scheduled and just, you know, again, having space to take more of what's going on around me in. And, uh, and there's been impatience. I want to ride my bike. You know, I want to swim. I guess I've learned a lot about my adaptability and with this illness and having been a very athletic, outgoing, movement, driving person to literally come to a point where I'm plugged in. <laughs> Joan did things her own way, and you could not tell her what to do. She was an incredible daredevil. She would do anything, and she was always looking for new peaks to conquer and new thrills. And uh, this was very much at odds with what was expected in her family in the Bronx, where women were expected to take on a fairly traditional Italian Catholic role. And that did not fit Joan at all. So Joan had to leave her family to follow her path. And so it came about that she was not surrounded by her family, all except for one sister and her nieces the people who were around her in her last year or two were her friends and her community. And it may have been one of the reasons that Joan was open with her, with her life and with her dying and invited people in. Joni didn't want to become a 
in part of a group at first. She was just exactly as I was about mm. it. She absolutely had no interest in it. She had a strong support community, just as I did, and didn't have any interest, in what, interest whatsoever. But I convinced her the same way I was convinced. Look, we live longer. So being able to talk about full dimension of actually living, right? living even more fuller, like what is the insight or the gift or the, um, um, the wake-up call that having cancer has given to us, mm -hmm. to be able to share that in a group. Right, which is what we did. And so to tell, to, to tell your story with other people who really understood mm -hmm. at a level that nobody else could understand, not my, my husband or my children mm -hmm. or my mother or people who loved me dearly, mm -hmm. none of these people could have possibly understood as well as everyone in that support group. Mm -hmm. It was a sisterhood mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. And I think Joni felt the same way because we talked in the early days when she did not want to be part mm -hmm. of that group. Mm -hmm. But it w she knew that it was a safe place to be, that she could tell the story, have others hear it, mm -hmm. that nobody would be criticizing her in any way whatsoever, right. but only there to love her, commiserate, and help in any mm -hmm. way possible. Mm -hmm. If there is time, after death first whispers to us, how might we live differently? Well, I'm breathing a lot better, not on oxygen. I went bald. I had several surgeries, living in a different place, living in a different body. The last time I was so ill that I had a lot of will about li living. And it's not that I don't still have that will. I just have more openness about the possibility of dying. And I feel like if this new episode is, a, is about that, is about dying, that what's important is for me to gather people around who can help me in that direction. She was crying. I came over to her house, and she was crying and crying. And I said, Joan, what's the matter? She says, it's just awful. I just saw it. She had just seen it. They just taken the bandage off. And she had, um, instead of being flat, it was, you know, in yeah, the, they took where the there was a mountain, out. there was now a crater. Mm -hmm. And I said, you have to let me see it. You have to face it. You have to just... You know. Well, see, this is why she asked me to take pictures of herself. She said, I want you to take some photographs of me because I want to try... You know, I look in the mirror and I don't know who I am. This and I just want... You know, I want you to be a mirror for me, she said, Blake. You know, so we took these pictures. And then she spent a lot of time looking at them. Mm -hmm. And she even did some drawings from some of them. If you think that Joan didn't sob her guts out sometimes, then you're way wrong. You know, who wouldn't? You have your body cut open again and again and again. You're in tremendous pain. You don't have your breasts anymore. You don't have your identity anymore. You don't even go out anymore. You don't know if you're going to live or die. Um, you've got Everyone around you has their opinion about whether you live or die and what you ought to do, and you have to manage everybody else's fear on top of your own. I mean, it's a big orchestration to be very sick and conscious. How many do you take at a meal? I would say 30 is a reasonable number, give or take one. Sometimes, I just can't even take them. It's too much for my body. Joan, like, rose from her ashes. She, the chemotherapy worked to the extent that she had a complete remission. She had no more cancer in her lungs. She had no more cancer detectable anyplace else. And so she went through a period where she was fine. I milked. The cow this morning, 
And we'll now to the hands. Is this enough, sir? Yep. To get us some fresh products for our meal today. They've made, been made with tender, loving care. And we're about ready to sit down. Am I eating alone? And then, some months later, it came back in her bones. Of course, they think that it's tumor pressing on the cord, so they're... <laughs> Their suggestion was to have radiation, which I've had three treatments, and... Um, I don't like it. I feel like my throat's on fire, and my lymph nodes in my chest are up, or swollen, and I feel weak again and tired, and... Um, we'll be negotiating this coming week about lowering the dosage. And uh, I have a very strong suspicion that I will not complete their recommended treatment. And uh, the, th the threat is <laughs> that if it is tumor, I'll be paralyzed. You know, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to be glib. It would be difficult to be paralyzed for sure, but there's also a sense of sense of surrender. Sometimes their bones hurt so much that we would just, just do these quiet holds. Just to be there, just to meet the pain. To ask nothing of the body but to pray for some peace and some comfort. This body has gone through a hell of a lot, and I'm just tired of going through the ringer and will put things into my body that are only healing. And uh, that means no more chemotherapy. And if that means I die, <laughs> then I die. I like the idea of being liberated from this body and not being in pain. Can we surrender to the inevitability of death and yet still fight to live? This is a drawing that I look at every morning that my niece Christine recently made for me. What are the things, what other exciting things did you do? I would take this bicycle and I would ride up this huge hill. It was torturous to get up. And I'd wait till as many cars would get off the road as possible. And then I would cruise down this hill, speeding, speeding. Tears would be coming out of my eyes. I would be going so fast. I would be passing cars. That's how fast I was going down this hill. And I would think, oh God, if I hit a pebble the wrong way, I'm dead meat. Because that's how fast I would go. And it would be thrilling. I would do that a couple times. So that was exciting. So issues about feeling abandoned have come up, or now people are going to abandon me because I've been sick too long and I'm, I'm boring and I'm no fun to be with because I can't do things. Having vulnerability is not weakness. And showing vulnerability, which she did over mm -hmm. and over, I mean she had to learn how mm -hmm. to do that, but mm -hmm. she did. 
was the most courageous and the most strong thing that a person could ever do. For me, that's what touched so many of us that knew Joan. Mm -hmm. Was to, to, it was so inspirational to watch her in the face of her mortality. She um, just kept opening and opening mm -hmm. and opening. opening. And uh, that was her strength rather than a weakness. Uh -huh. Voila! She's up. two weeks and then I'm going to be bright red and bald. Ah. Western medicine refuses to let my hair grow. Every time I get to the stage, they want to chemo or radiate it off. Moments. <laughs> I'm really so Raquel Welch, <laughs> playing a woman with breast cancer who's metastasized to the lungs, recovered from that, bone and now brain. I was going through the organs last night. Hmm, what's left? I don't know how you feel. Like, in my mind, I thought, I wonder if Al sees me as terminal now, which has a different ambiance and way of, you know, dealing or treating me as opposed to last year, although last year I looked <laughs> terminal too. You know, last year I clearly had chemo as an anchor, and, and that isn't here. But, um,. I just need to get a sense, I want to hear what you're thinking, I want to also tell you what I'm thinking, and that, you know, that I don't feel like, um, like, I don't feel like I'm in denial. I mean, I feel really clear, you know, that this is a big load here, and I am, you know, taking care of business and doing my ceremony and talking about the whole dying process, and also, not losing hope, you know. Mm -hmm. That you still see me as this viable being who, yes, I have cancer, but, and and there are still possibilities. You know what I mean, Al? Like, just don't put me in this terminal, like, we're yes. just going to make Joe comfortable. You know what I mean? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Al. <laughs> the, the truth of the matter is, I don't, put people in the categories on the way along their treatment because it's not constructive to me to say, okay, we're going to change and mm -hmm. approach you differently. Not in terms of throwing diagnoses and prognoses and 
terms like terminal around. On the other hand, every time I see you and try to understand where your disease is at, I have to be thinking, what is the most appropriate thing to offer based on what I know about what I can do at this point? And so my tools will be different. What you're doing in terms of planning for the end of your life and what you're doing in terms of planning, in terms of getting enough support at home, mm -hmm. are all the right things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I don't want to get bogged down with saying goodbye and things like that because what we got to do is we got to go on with the process of your living. Right. That's what I like to hear. Right. And, yeah. and I think it's really clear because nobody likes to feel, oh, you're going to die and now we'll just make you as comfortable as we I mean, nobody wants to hear that, even if they're not in denial. They just want to say, but I'm still alive and I'm still here. I'm still The things we can do to here. make you feel better and more like your old self. Not just feel better, Yeah. but try to restore some of yeah. the person you were. Yeah. Thanks, Al. You're wonderful as usual. Okay, you have to turn this off because i got to hug her. Oh, <laughs> great. Okay. Thanks, Al. Yourself. I will. Give me a call if you need me. I will. Um, Think I of me biking next week. Good. I hope you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we accept it, when we finally accept that we will die, what passes away and what gets born? Joan was told on July 10th that she had a brain tumor, and the doctor told her she had two weeks to be conscious if she didn't radiate. And if she radiated, she would have six months. And she just said she didn't feel like she could get everything done in two weeks. So that's the condition. So they radiate me to keep me around for a little bit longer. It's like I was realizing I was on this tightrope of, am I living? Am I dying? How am I walking through the day to day to get ready to die? Or am I walking through the day to get ready to live. It's neither here or there. All I know is I got today. Whoever comes to visit or hang out, that's what I got. You know, I look at these pictures of me when I was mobile and physically able, and I just wonder what the possibilities really are to regain some of that. I don't know. I haven't a clue. I remember this one time that she um, just started cracking up laughing because she said, Blake, all this time we've been worried about, like, after I die, um, are, are you going to be able to recognize me? She said, what if I don't recognize <laughs> you? <laughs> How am I going to know them? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like, it was interesting dynamic, like, you know, here are people on Earth, and someone's dying. Oh, the smoke. The smoke. You know, like, I'm going to this other place, and because you guys are here, you have access to me. Access, you know, from my past belongings, or pictures, or memories. And yet I'm going to this other place where I don't know what I'm going to look like, you know, what's going to be out there, and even if... I'm going to be able to recognize you people or come back or like, what the hell? <laughs> it's such a joke. It's such a joke. I mean, this thing of attachment and, and I have it. I mean, I'm scared of dying and going to this other realm that I don't know. I mean, you know, you can read multiple accounts of what it's supposed to be like. And it's like, who knows what's real? I believe, or have believed, on a certain level, that with my mind and the ability of the mind, then why can't I grow more breasts? I mean, that's how... That's a thought. I mean, it's, it's like a... That shouldn't be impossible. <laughs> you know, and, and there really is a part of me that's like, it's not impossible. 
And there's also part of me that's like, you're crazy. You are out of your bird. I don't think it needs to be qualified. I don't think it needs to be Joan died of cancer. Joan's dead. You know, Joan died. I just die. And I walked a good way. You know, and, and that's really all I want to do. I just want to walk in a good way and still with a sense of who I am and my values and, you know, my friends and that I was thinking to the very end about, you know, my life and what was important and I didn't just, that I didn't just stop and give up because someone gave me a diagnosis. That's what I want people to say, you know? Joan died, but she walked a really good way. Can we fully live if we haven't fully accepted that we will die? Grandmothers of the West, I see you looking at me. I pray to you, pray to you, pray to you. I see you looking at me. Today we pray for Joan's healing, and we ask that you grant us to release into our song, into our voices, into our memory, into our love for Joan, and of course, always into the expectation that there is unlimited possibility for healing while releasing our expectation of what that looks like. So often I've sat at your altar calling you So here I call you again, looking for my reflection. I stand before you and ask to rest before you now. Come take me home. Come shine before my friends. Show them the beauty before them. Blessed be. And so I ask for your prayers to help me move quickly and smoothly on my journey because I'm really ready to go. Mm -hmm. So that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. For years and years, I struggled just to love my life. And then the butterfly rose weightless in the wind. Don't love your life too much, it said. Mm. 
and vanished into the world. <laughs> And what's going on now for you? Well... <laughs> I am alive. When we met again not long after the, the healing circle, I remember her thinking that it had healed her. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. she really took away a feeling that all of that love mm -hmm. healed her. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done a lot, and so like, geez, now I'm going to leave? When I finally get it? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I'd like to, you know, in a certain way, I'd like to bask in, in the lessons and, and um, sort of relish the lessons that I've learned. Where's that letting go? Do I just let it go and stop pushing my body and putting my body in a painful state? And just let go and let the cancer take me away. And why is it that death pushes us to this place of such open-heartedness? That's sort of bittersweet. What does it mean to heal? Can we heal as we die? She looked really peaceful at the end, and uh, like she, like boy, she'd really done a lot of work. I, I like Joan. Just, I, I just think she came into this life, and she's, you know, it was like before she came in, she said, you know, I'm really going to work. I'm really going to do a lot in this life. I am really going to get some work done, and I think she did. Birds are so quiet when they fly. Right in the air currents. Effortless flying. Like effortless living. Could that be possible? So maybe what it is is acceptance of death. And maybe what it is is that we all go around all our lives fighting this thing. We have this energy that's going toward fighting fear of death, which is behind all of our fear and our insecurity. And maybe that there comes a time when you just drop it. And then for the first time in your life, you're free. Patches of hair? Yes, they're, they're still there? Well, 
No, right? They are, but um, yes, like here's the little pattern. There's a pattern, there's a pattern. It's all in here, and then you have much less right here. You have nothing there. Right? It's not growing very fast, but it's, it's patchy, and then you have none down here, and none there. I hope I'm not going to be one of those people that have to comb my hair across my scalp. Oh, God. We yeah. can try this, Joan, here. <laughs> <laughs> Joan is a blonde. How do I look? <laughs> huzzle, huzzle. Huh? Oh, baby, get that hair out of your eyes. <laughs> it feels weird. Oh, God. <laughs> Purple stuff. Purple stuff. What is it? And uh, why are you doing such things? Well, it's a uh, herbal remedy called the Te Elixir. It's an herbal extract. And it supposedly has cured people with terminal cancer within a month. I think Joan could not be less like a poster girl for breast cancer. So it's harmless. Except insofar as everyone is unique. But I think Joan was really unique. So There's no reason why I can't be a miracle. Yeah. There's no reason why what I'm doing cannot cure me. It's cured other people. Why not me? There were times when I felt like Joan was like Joan of Arc, you know, that she was so much like the warrior, like the Amazon warrior. You know, she was so strong, such a fighter, and she was so emphatic about doing it her own way. Nice and cold. Frizola. I'm not going to feel a thing. I'd really never seen anything never. like her will. and. What she was willing to go through, too, I think she was willing to, I think she could have died and gone out more easily two years before she actually died. And I think most people would not have come back from that somehow. And Joan just fought her way back from that. She just wanted more life and she fought her way back. And what she got was an extra two years, but a, but a difficult two years. And I often used to think that I'm not sure I would have made her choice, if it's a choice, that I might have just stopped fighting sooner. How long can I sustain this amount of cancer? And I don't know. Nobody knows. When someone dies in a calm and loving way, who benefits? Do the dying, do the living. Support groups come in all all forms. A special support group, if you will. It was informal, but Friday evening, oh, every I Friday mean, evening she had I remember drumming her, and rattling. She, right, that was towards the end, yes, right? Yes, towards she, the end. She was mm -hmm. kind of like, right. oh, I don't I know mean, if I can sit up and talk in support group meetings, but she loved to right. like, chant and have drumming, singing, rattling, and so we would just, whoever showed up, we'd do that. Right. And it was a wonderful support. The last conversation that we had, I knew it would be our last, and it was that Friday night before she went unconscious. I walked in and she looked at me and she started to cry and she said, I'm sorry. And I said, you don't have to apologize. And she said, but I wish we could have been old ladies together. Mm -hmm. 
So it was so great just to acknowledge that, that mm -hmm. I said, well, I wish we could have done that too, but, mm -hmm. but you'll, you know, be uh, with me. I've been quiet, been immobile, been drugged, groggy. I don't want to die depressed. I have choice here, you know? And yeah, I'm sad that I'm going to miss people and stuff like that, but it's been a lot of great things happening, and that's where I want to keep my focus. I always have hope. There are days when I'm sad when I think about dying and missing my friends and nieces particularly, and just miss that I won't be around when they're, when I think I could really be a good help to them and influence and help them get some, through some of their pubic teenager years. Do you feel as though you have tied up all the loose ends? Is there anything left? That well, I think there's always something left. But I feel like at this point, what is going to be resolved will be resolved as much as it can at this point. And yes, things could use a few more years, but they don't, I don't have that. And so what I have a sense of, particularly with my family, is that things will, won't be totally resolved. She never completed her relationship with her, her parents. And even when I talk to her about, you know, you have to forgive their ignorance. Because the forgiving is part of the healing that we go through. We talk about her mother, and she would still be angry. So that the armoring that she had, um, so much of the armoring had softened and fallen away, but there were still some very rough edges. And with her some sister. Real, some real hard places there. There were. But I feel like that I've softened and that my singing and chanting, we are holy people and we're all one, that that has to be my practice. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to, but how can I chant that all morning or for my morning chant and then ignore it for the rest of the day? I can't. That's not who I am. And so that has cracked more doors in my family for me to be more um, receptive to communicating, particularly with my parents and my sister Val. I don't know if there's going to be, com I don't think there'll be complete resolution. It's just too many years of muck -a muck But to leave it like this feels a lot nicer than not talking, or you know what I mean? But I think she softened a very little bit about her mother because when I said to her something about letting her mother come and just say goodbye to her, she said, well, I think I've waited too long though and I really don't want to let her see me like this. Yes. So there was that one little a bit of compassion bit of compassion that came in towards the very very she wanted end to there. save her mother from seeing her look as bad as she did which which i felt was very important for mm -hmm. her very important mm -hmm. for her mm -hmm. her final passing mm -hmm. if i die or something guess if you'd stay with me and maybe call blake and she i think she knows more who to call to she'll call tom and so people will come and pray The body dies, but is there something that never perishes? Her body is really shutting down. Joan is very actively dying. Um, I would imagine that she will die, if not today, in the next few days. 
making the transition between this world and the next. Time to say our goodbyes and send her on her way. There's so many ways to go. I know. You need to cry. The more grieving and crying you can do now, the, the easier it is. Mm. Or the less stuck it gets anyway. It's not easy. It's mm. not easy at all. Mm. And Joan has been such a vital force. Definitely. If you are here when she does go, you just call us. Oh, you don't call the police? No. Oh, okay. Do not call the police. Oh, Do not call 911. No. Do not call the hospital. Do not call the No, I wouldn't call the hospital. I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. even call the police, but now I know not to call yeah. the police. Call you first. Just call us. That's all you need to do is call us and friends, you know, and right. family, right. that sort of thing. Right. Just call us. Right. So, okay. And then you do, it doesn't have to be flashing lights and all the rest. It's no. still just yeah, peaceful. peaceful. Okay. And you can have the time that you want to be with her after she goes. Thank you a lot. What's being done um, by, to prepare for her death by her friends? Um, I believe they are gathering to come and to try to give support to the family as well and just to be here around the clock so somebody can be with her as she goes on the last leg of her journey. When all of us reach the fullness of our days, then we leave. And the fullness of our days may be but an hour or it may be a hundred years. For those of us who remain to make peace with that, it's sad for those who remain. It's sad for those of us who lose who Joan is and everything that she meant in our lives. But for Joan herself, as she makes the final transition, it will be fine. like to talk to hospice about how long, how long we could keep her here. Um, uh, I know that for an, a number of hours it's going to be fine, you know, maybe even overnight or whatever. Um, she had said to me it's important in, in some traditions to not to not be touched uh, or moved at all for an hour. So, at least an hour.
It's my nature. It's always been my nature. Survival. From when I was like two, I was damned if I wasn't going to survive. I was going to survive come hell or high water. <laughs>